from where you live with Inside Out. Hello there, I'm Matthew Wright and welcome back to Inside Out London. I hope you had a lovely summer, managed to keep your cool during the glorious heatwave. Well, over the course of this new series, we'll be bringing you plenty of in-depth reports on some of the best stories from around the capital. Over the summer, there have been yet more shocking headlines about gangs of men grooming young girls before subjecting them to horrific sexual abuse. Now, most of the cases that have been reported on have involved attacks on vulnerable white girls, but they're not the only young women being preyed upon. And tonight, young victims from a different community are going to speak out for the first time. They're breaking their silence in order to secure the justice that they say has been denied to them. Chris Rogers presents this special Inside Out London investigation, but I should warn you that some viewers may find some of the content of this film disturbing. Bradford, Rochdale, Oxford, Telford. In all of these recent high-profile cases, gangs of men have been convicted of grooming young and vulnerable white girls. But there is another group of victims whose stories haven't been told until now. A nine-year-old, a 10-year-old, 11-year-old being sexually abused. That shouldn't be tolerated in the streets that we live on. Behind the doors of Britain's Sikh community, girls speak for the very first time about how they too have been groomed and then subjected to horrific sexual abuse by groups of men. I can't sleep at all now because I keep getting nightmares. I attempted suicide on my 16th birthday. I felt used and abused like a piece of rubbish. He was like sleep with this guy, this is my friend and it was horrible. I just wished I was dead. We hear how being abused can leave Sikh girls isolated from their own community. I think my family is that embarrassed of everyone knowing. At some point, I thought my parents would turn against me too. And we investigate claims that the police are failing to protect Sikh children from a network of child abusers. The support uh, from the police has been zero. Why aren't we getting the same support as other communities are getting? Jaswinder was only 13 when a man began the process of grooming her. He seemed like a really sweet guy. I started skipping school just to go out with him. Then he'd buy me stuff and pay for my stuff. And then he bought me a phone to stay in contact with him. He made me feel like I was the centre of attention. He spent weeks slowly gaining Jaswinder's trust, but he had a hidden agenda. He took me out to a hotel and then gave me a drink. I didn't know what happened after that. The next morning, Jaswinder woke up naked and realised her drink had been spiked. The man she thought she could trust had taken obscene photos of her and threatened to show them to her parents unless she agreed to have sex with other men. They were like those, like, like those alcoholics you'd see on the streets. The blackmail and abuse continued for over 18 months. Jaswinder claims that the man who forced her into prostitution initially hid his true identity. He didn't say he was Sikh, but the way he acted and talked and his appearance. He had a gold kanda and he had a kara. His appearance was just like a Sikh. Wearing sacred symbols of Sikhism, she claims he had deceived her into thinking he was from the same religion. In fact, he was a Muslim. They definitely weren't Sikhs. They're just someone from a different culture saying they're part of yours, lying, and it's really terrifying for anyone. <laughs> This is one of the few times that Jaswinder has actually talked about what happened to her. She says she has very loving parents, but in this Asian community, family honour is paramount. She's been warned by her mother against bringing the subject up at home and forbidden from telling her father the full details. Parents are the last ones to find out if anything goes wrong. I was scared to tell my dad. There's just some stuff you can't tell them and I just tried to keep myself to myself and not talk to anyone about it. Inside Out has discovered that there are many other Sikh girls like Jaswinder, with no one to confide in. 
Kulwans is another teenager struggling with the terrible consequences of sexual exploitation. At the age of 16, she has been paid for sex by many older men. As a result, she self-harms. This is the first time I've actually had a look at your arms. Is it just the arms? My legs as well. And my stomach. These ones on my hands I did as I wasn't able to cope. This man is not a counsellor, a social worker, or a police officer. But he's been trying to help victims of grooming in his community for over a decade. Uh, we're from the Seek Awareness Society, and our main mission really is to raise awareness on a terrible subject, sexual grooming. It is a very heartbreaking subject when you listen to some of the stuff that goes on on the streets of Britain. Mohan Singh helped set up the Sikh Awareness Society back in the 90s, after growing concern within his community that young children were being sexually abused. Just how big a problem is the sexual grooming of girls within the Sikh community? It is a massive problem. Just imagine you've got a 24-hour helpline, which, to be honest, never stops ringing. The more we dig into it, the more we're finding. Currently, we're dealing with 19 cases all the way from north to, to, to the south in, in Leeds, in Bradford, Birmingham, in uh, Southall. The plight of girls like Kulwant and Jaswinda is the reason behind Mohan's mission to visit every single one of the UK's 300 Gurdwaras. Today, he's at one of the biggest in Leeds. You have to be brave. You have to tackle the subjects that nobody's going to tackle. In simple terms, sexual exploitation is when someone takes advantage of you sexually for their benefit. There's a strong turnout, but this is uncomfortable listening for most Sikhs. The sexual grooming of girls can be a taboo subject in this community. One of Mohan's biggest battles is persuading families to reach out for help. It's one of them really personal issues which most families just don't want to talk about at all. Yeah. And we really need to be able to somehow be able to engage people. I think parents do need to be a bit more approachable. When your parents are so strict, who are you supposed to go to? These girls will be from Amratari parents. They dare go home and tell their mum and dad. Because it's such a, a taboo subject, we need to have an internal look. And whatever we find, we might not like the findings but we can have a solution to them. And if we get the solution, we can save hundreds of the girls. Sikh communities are very honor-based, with deeply held traditional religious views that go back for centuries. As part of the code of honor that Sikhs live by, virginity before marriage is held sacred. This can make life very difficult for groomed Sikh girls and their families. In order to ensure that they can get married and to maintain dignity in the community, many parents feel they have to live by a code of secrecy, never revealing the abuse of their children. In fact, the stigma around sexual abuse can be so detrimental to a Sikh girl's future that victims are often sent away from the family home, sometimes permanently. Twelve months ago, a 16-year-old was sent 6,000 miles to America to start a new life. Security is tight for her own safety. I have to be vetted before I can meet her. So the only thing I know about the girl that I've come here to meet is that she's willing to talk to me. I don't know her name, I don't know her address. The instructions that have been given are to drive to this remote town in California and wait for a call. Eventually, I get a call. Bobby, hi. Yeah, this is Chris. Uh-huh. OK, see you then. All right, thanks. I'm told to head to a small remote town where I can meet with the contact. There he is. So you'll take me to, to the house? Yeah, sure. OK, brilliant. Oh. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks. At this point, we're asked to turn off our cameras to avoid revealing the location. My first impression of the girl, who we'll call Napreet, is she's like any other teenager, be it living thousands of miles from home. OK, I brought you something back from Britain, from your mum and dad. I don't quite know what's in there. Should we have a look? What have we got? Clothes, a dictionary. My strawberry pyjamas. 
Come on, you must be able to get strawberry pajamas in America. No, it isn't. It's nothing like home. So it reminds me of home. Oh, that is stunning. And isn't just. It? That's uh, to wear at the temple. Yeah. That's lovely. What else do you miss about home? What are the home comforts? Baked beans. Baked beans. <laughs> yeah. They don't have baked beans here. What was the main reason for coming here? I think for me personally, it was that everyone knew. What everyone knew about Napreet back in London was that when she was 15, she'd been groomed and then blackmailed into having sex with several older men over many months. It started at the Nagarkirtan, which is like uh, Visaki Nagarkirtan, and it's a festival where you all walk, and it's just to celebrate who we are as Sikhs, and this guy approached me, and he asked me for my number, and he was around like 18, 19, and he was wearing a kara, a Sikh bracelet, which is our identity, and he was wearing a bandana, and he was like, oh, like, we should meet up, and... I met up with him with, like, other friends, like... Over the next few weeks, he showered Napreet with lots of attention and gifts, while slowly ostracising her from her family and friends. All the classic hallmarks of grooming, but for a vulnerable teenage girl, it was love. He told me that I was special and I was just so happy. Were you falling for him? I was. But then things changed. He, he would kiss me and, like... He would touch me and like we did have like sexual contact and I felt so guilty, I felt so bad and when he knew that I was backing off, he showed me pictures. He had pictures of us like kissing, like someone was taking pictures from far away and like pictures of like his hands like down my trousers and he said that if you like leave me now I will show your parents. I didn't know what to say, and the only thing I could say to him is like, you're another Sikh guy, you, you know what our parents are like, you know that my parents would kill me, they, you know that you can't do this. And that's when he told me that he wasn't a Sikh guy. And I just, I didn't know what to, I didn't know what to do, he was a Muslim guy. Over the coming months, Napreet was prostituted to countless men. Every time, she was promised the explicit photos of her would be destroyed if she slept with one more customer. She claims her judgment was impaired by the steady stream of drugs her groomer fed her. I would wake up drugged and it would force drinks down me. And I remember times where I would wake up and there would be like five people in a room. Man. And, yeah. Do you think it is something that you will ever be able to move on from and, and get over? Um, I'm not sure. Coming here has definitely made a difference. The family just wants to try to sort of end or try to forget what's happened and move on with their life. And they know that a girl which is tarnished with this kind of thing will never actually get married. So we do help in taking that child away, giving a break to the family because that child, the family knows that she is in safe hands. I feel safe here, knowing that I'm away from all the hurt and the horror, and I know that those people are so far away from me, and I know that they can't get hold of me. They don't know where I am. After almost a year, Napreet has settled into her new life, living with surrogate Sikh parents. She spends her time painting, studying, and teaching at the temple. She says coming here has been a fresh start. But a counsellor who has dealt with many victims of grooming in her clinic says Napreet's new life may be causing her more harm. We have cases where children have actually been removed from their home environment when they've talked about the fact they're being sexually exploited. Now the problem here is number one, it's not the child's fault. Secondly, by removing them from the home, it gives a very strong message which is you are the problem. And unless somebody is saying you are not responsible, you're totally innocent and you deserve all the care and love and support that you can possibly get, the long-standing issues will be enormous. My parents were angry with what happened to me, but they were accusing me, like, you couldn't stay away from it, you couldn't do anything, why were you doing it, this in the first place? I still believe that sometimes they, they blame me. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back to London? Depending on where life takes me, 
hopefully I I will be able to go back. Like coming here, it's, it's almost like I'm just I've got a second chance to live my life again. Next, a dozen other British Sikh girls whose parents have sent them out of the country and out of harm's way. Sending your daughter abroad might seem extreme, but I've discovered that many Sikh parents believe their children are in danger here in the UK. They believe that their children are being targeted by gangs of Muslim groomers. It's an accusation that is deeply controversial. The two faith groups have a history of religious conflict. The Sikh community has been a target of child abusers since probably 1999. Over the last five years, it's become a growing problem. As much as people don't like it to be said, they are being targeted by Muslim youth. And some of the cases that we're coming across, young girls have been targeted in parks playing on swings. Who are grooming? You can read the names for yourselves. Same kind of people keep cropping up. Well, the majority of the time, I'm talking about 98% of the time, they are of Pakistani origin and they belong to the Islamic faith. When you're getting five or six calls a week from concerned parents, it just is a massive problem. Sheikh Ibrahim of the British Muslim Council believes there is little evidence to suggest organized gangs are specifically targeting Sikh girls. We have been in contact with some of the communities who have been affected by this, in particular our Sikh communities. I personally have had meetings and discussions with this. We have to base all these allegations on evidence. If it's just going to be allegations which cannot be substantiated, then there could be tension between our communities. Even though Muslim men have been convicted in recent cases, he believes that profiling groomers by their religion is a mistake. Well, the Muslim Council of Britain's position is absolutely clear that uh, child sexual exploitation and grooming is the most despicable, abhorrent crime, and it should be treated as a crime, plain and simple. We acknowledge that the recent cases that have come to light in our courts and the sentences that have been passed have involved a disproportionate and large number of men who belong to uh, the faith of Islam. But it is very wrong for society to blame an entire community for the actions of a few. A report on child sexual exploitation by the Children's Commissioner for England revealed that those who commit the crime of grooming come from diverse backgrounds. A number of representatives from the Sikh community came to talk to me about their very real and serious concerns um, about some of their girls being targeted by Muslim men. Our evidence was very, very clear that this is not a crime committed by one ethnic group or one faith group against another. This crime is happening across all our communities, all our faith groups, um, and within every ethnic group. But what do the groomers themselves say? Do they specifically target Sikh girls? One man who claims he turned his back on a grooming gang and is in hiding agreed to talk. How rife is it? If you're in a car worth £5,000 upwards, you're pretty much guaranteed to get sex with an 11 to 16 year old girl on an evening. Do people pretend to be Sikh? People pretend to be Sikh just to get laid, basically. Why Sikh girls? Why are they going for Sikh girls in particular? Why Sikh girls? Well, I don't think a Sikh girl would actually tell her parents, obviously, what she's up to, or that the parents would actually report it if they were to find out. With so many families too ashamed to report abuse, it seems a Sikh girl makes an easy victim for the groomers. The fact of the matter is it doesn't matter whether you're from the Sikh community, from a muslim based faith community. If you're aware of child abuse and you're not reporting it, to the authorities, then you're doing the wrong thing. You're allowing it to get worse. You're allowing it to fester. Majority of parents, all they want to do is shut up shop as if nothing has happened. But over the years now, slowly, slowly, people are coming forward. People are coming forward and talking. Gurmeet and Ranjit, not their real names, 
are one of the few Sikh parents who have been brave enough to report the abuse endured by their child to the police. They believe their daughter has been the target of a group of groomers for the past six years. We only were aware of things going wrong when something drastic would happen, like her 14th birthday. We bought her a mobile phone and she was then taking pictures and these pictures were being sent out to third parties. Sexual pictures? Yeah. And when we started going through her phone and things like that, the numbers were on her phone. She had loads and loads of numbers on her phone under female names. But when you dial the numbers, you can distinctively tell that they were older males. Some of the men they believe Javine was being groomed by were in their 40s and 50s. In desperation, Gurmeet sold their house and moved the family out of London. It's quite a drastic move, though, to, to move 120 miles up north to get away from these men. But it didn't work. It didn't work. Why? They had her details and they wanted to pursue it all the way. By doing some research online, Gurmeet discovered that a group of men in London passed Javine's details onto another group based in the West Midlands. It all starts in London and in the West Midlands. You've got three perpetrators who are all linked. So the, we're talking of like a network. Right. Through all of this, Gurmeet and Ranjit claim they've struggled to get the police to take their case seriously. Nobody seems to be interested in investigating it further. How many times do you think you've called the police over the last three or four years? There have been incidents where we have rung several times a day to get information, to update, and they've just had a blasé attitude. Ranjit and Gurmeet recently took their case to the Police Complaints Commission. West Midlands Police say investigations into Javine's situation are ongoing. The confidence to talk to the police and the authorities is at a very low level. Why are they not investigating these cases? I think the main problem why they're not investigating, either there's a fear factor of uh, you know, bringing that, the Muslim Sikh issue and the community tensions and everything like that. I don't think they understand the extent of the problem and, and the cultural backgrounds and the religious sensitivities of the situations. In Southeast Asian communities I have seen historically uh, where victims are not well served because of police sensitivity about engaging a community whose tradition is all about honour and shame. So that sensitivity sometimes can be overplayed and I think in those cases where it is, police and other statutory authorities pause uh, for too long. I do think there is quite a way to go um, in terms of police forces around the country truly waking up to the fact that there are ethnic minority victims of sexual abuse. With many in the Sikh community believing the police are unwilling or unable to help solve grooming cases, Mohan has undertaken something radical. He's been tracking down the groomers himself. The Sikh Awareness Society does conduct its own investigations to see if it is a, a sexual grooming case. And if it is, we tell the parents uh, steps that they need to take. Recently, Mohan worked on the first ever case involving a Sikh victim of sexual grooming to have been successfully taken to court. Although the perpetrators have all now been sentenced, his work is not done. He remains in close contact with the victim to guide her through the healing process. I can't even say my full name now. I can't get myself to say my full name now. Why is that then? Because a the person, she's disappeared. Nobody knows where she is. Subconsciously, like in the back of my head, I'm thinking about them. I can remember everything. Reliving them, them same scenes again in your head. You just want to completely move away from it. That, that young lady doesn't exist anymore. I just don't want to be me anymore. Mohan got involved in Kulwant's case because he felt the police were slow on the uptake. The parents have already approached the police prior to us getting involved. Now, if the police had done their job, there would be no need for the family to approach us. Determined to prove that Kulwant was being abused, Mohan Singh launched his own private investigation. Over several weeks, he revisited all the locations where the abuse occurred and tracked down witnesses. Ultimately, he provided the police with key evidence that led to an investigation and helped convict the abusers. The three men had denied 22 counts of sexual offences against a child. At their trial this morning, a change in plea. The three admitted five counts of paying for sex with a child. The three men, together with three others who pleaded guilty at an earlier hearing, will be sentenced at the end of the month. All the information, the names, 
the car registration numbers, the places where they took her. That was compiled into a little, uh, a couple of forms. And we had a meeting with um, a police and social services of Leicester. And we gave them that information. And that's when the invest they started to investigate. Do you accept that it was the Sikh community, it was the Sikh Awareness Society that brought this case to you? Yes, sir. they actually went to, Sikh Awareness Society went to the Leicestershire County Council Social Care Department, who then came to the police and we were able to start an investigation the day they told us that around the concerns. There have been complaints from the Sikh community that there was a slow uptake in this investigation. Is that fair? I don't think it is fair. Um, I think these investigations are challenging. So I want to reassure communities, we didn't just wait, we weren't slow on the uptake. Within 24 hours of being told about the potential concerns, we put our dedicated investigation team together and we tried to secure evidence straight away. The success of this case has raised hopes that other Sikh victims will come forward too. But for parents Ranjit and Gurmeet, their daughter is a long way from that. She is still under the control of her alleged groomers. Their pain has compelled them to try and save other children. They've opened up their home as a safe haven. The purpose of us providing a halfway house is to allow other families that are stuck in our situation somewhere for the children which is safe. Because nine out of 10 times, the alternative is that the children go back to the perpetrators. It's rewarding in the sense that we're trying to do something positive. The girls with no one to confide in, the child living thousands of miles away from her family, the parents seeking their daughter. All of them have spoken in this film for one reason, to stop the abuse. I don't think they should be allowed to get away with it. I want it to stop. I want them to stop hurting children. For a list of organisations offering help and advice, please visit our website, that's bbc.co.uk forward slash action line. Or you can call the BBC Action Line for recorded information. The number is 08000 566 424. Lines are open 24 hours. Calls from most landlines are free, but some networks and mobile operators will charge.